been practitioners, but also have worked in all sorts of different aspects of it. So I'm pleased to introduce our three panelists, and I'll start with um, the person sitting directly to my left. This is Mr. Chauncey Spears. He currently serves as the Director of Advanced Learning and Gifted Programs with the Mississippi Department of Education. Prior to his current appointment, he worked with the Department of Education as a Social Studies Specialist, where he was involved um, in areas including teacher training. We at the Hamer Institute worked with him in the William Winter Institute, more specifically the provision of initial teacher training when the required civil rights curriculum was initially implemented. Mr. Spears works in such areas as advanced placement, gifted programs, social studies, um, dual credit, dual enrollment programs. To his left is Dr. William E. McHenry, or your right, would be Dr. Uh, William E. McHenry, who is the executive director of the Mississippi East Center here at Jackson State University. Prior to coming to the East Center, he served as the Vice Chancellor for Academic and Student Affairs for the Oklahoma State Regents for Higher Education. And before that, he was the Assistant Commissioner for, the academic, affair, for academic Affairs for the Mississippi Institution um, of Higher Learning from 1997 to 2004. Prior to that, he was a Program Officer at the National Science Foundation and began his career um, as an Organic Chemistry Professor at Mississippi State University. To his left is Dr. Vivian Taylor. She's Professor of Elementary and Early Childhood Education in the Department of Education here at Jackson State. She earned her ED, her ED from the University of Cincinnati in teaching and instruction, reading, and teacher education. She served as a board member of the Southern Region um, Education Board on an NK steering committee and as a SACS review team. So she's worked um, pretty assiduously in higher education review. Her work in education has been international as well in nature, um, as serving as the director of Jackson State's textbooks and learning materials program, where they provided educational resources for teachers in Zambia, Africa, and that was funded through the Mississippi Consortium for International Development. So what we're hoping to hear from our three speakers today are some evaluations and considerations of where we are now 50 years later in the area of education. So what we're gonna do is a couple of things. We have some questions in which each of the panel, one panelist is gonna take the lead, make some initial comments, and the other panelists will chime in. And so the first question I'm asking all of them to briefly comment upon is kind of the, the baseline question. What is the educational status of African Americans in Mississippi today? In the no. no. Very good uh, question to start with. Uh, first, I wanted to thank uh, the Hamer Institute. Okay. Just press it one time. There you go. Just want to thank. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to thank the, the Hamer Institute uh, and the fine people at Jackson State for inviting me to come and, and, and to share uh, some thoughts about uh, the status of African Americans in Mississippi today, education wise. Um, well, I guess the status of African Americans in the state of Mississippi is a, is a microcosm and a, and a, uh, a, a microscope or microscopic representation of the challenges that Mississippi faces as a whole, uh, as a state. Um, it, it's well documented that uh, we have definite challenges when it comes to uh, uh, student achievement in the state. Uh, and, and, and I think a lot of that has to do with uh, the reality of uh, poverty, the reality of resegregation uh, that's taking place in a lot of the communities, um, and um, the reality of brain drain. Um, a lot of the communities are, are, st are struggling uh, because um, there just aren't enough uh, people uh, in the communities who have the expertise or the human capital uh, to really make uh, education a world-class experience for all children. That's not saying that Mississippi as a state as a whole doesn't have anyone doing good job, good work. We do. But um, on average, uh, if you can just look at the districts that are so called uh, excelling with a so called grade of A, uh, according to accountability, and then you look at some of the districts that are, that are struggling with a so called grade of F, accountability, you can also draw almost a direct correlation to the, the amount of residential segregation that's taking place in those communities, the amount of concentrated poverty that's taking place in those communities, and the lack of infrastructure development, economic development, things of that nature. So it goes hand in hand. So if we look at um, uh, the, at the actual status of African Americans in particular, uh, just as in, in, in many other indices uh, around the country, African Americans uh, show you 
know, that, that there is a gap in terms of services rendered, there's a gap in terms of equity of opportunity, there's a gap in terms of, 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 of educational attainment, and that's what we see in Mississippi. I have some slides that can kind of more meet this out, but we'll get to that a little bit later. So I think that, as, in a nutshell, it, to the degree that Mississippi is struggling, uh, magnify that, and we can kind of uh, guesstimate to the degree to which African American citizens around the state are struggling in terms of educational attainment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McElmore, and uh, uh, moderator for allowing me to come and organic chemists and talk with you about the status <laughs> of education in Mississippi. And, and I think it's appropriate because I've looked at the status of education in Mississippi from K through uh, graduate school. Because we did, when, when I was in another position, we took two databases and merged them. We could track a person from elementary school to they went into the teaching profession and actually was out in the classroom. We needed to know that because we need to speak from facts. We need to know how far we've come, where we are, so we know where we're going. And the bottom line is, compared to when uh, Ms. Hamer was alive and during her time, they had to fight Jim Crow laws. They had so many barriers to keep them from achieving. The young folks today, in my generation too, to a large degree, we went through freedom of choice, where we got textbooks with names written in them, and you had to write on the side of it, because there was no space to write on the other one. Yeah. And it, uh, I gotta keep my language straight back and forth, but we, it used to make me so angry. Nadine Gill and I shared a science book, because without sharing that book, we wouldn't know what was going on. Okay. Pages were torn out, things were written over, but we weren't going to let that stop us. We kept going. I got a doctorate degree in chemistry. As a matter of fact, so many guys who had books first later became my good white folk, became my good friends. So it, sometimes a struggle can make you grow. And the more you struggle, the, the more you develop your talents and skills. Now, where are we today? There are more Mississippians achieving high levels of education more degrees and more different types of institutions than ever in the history of the state. We know that, but we also know there are some gaps and some problems. We know per capita income is twice as much for whites as it is for blacks with similar degrees. We know about the socioeconomic factors that make it difficult for our kids to, to uh, achieve, and we know that in some instances we have to talk to our young folks about how not to cripple or to handicap themselves as they're trying to go through school. You don't learn to be a chemist deciding to go take math in 12th grade. <laughs> you don't decide that I'm going to be a PhD when in the seventh grade Johnny looks so pretty and all of a sudden you and Johnny got a, a child. You mean those, there's some barriers in our community that we are imposing on ourselves. And I'm certain as others have stated, Ms. Hamer would say, how could you miss out with all these opportunities? We have a new department head in communication. He came over, he's over in the East Center. He came from a big school. He came and he looked at the weather station we have over there, 200 weather places around the country. He looked at TV 22, TV 23, Soul Network in the South, state-of-the-art equipment. And he said, you guys have better equipment than many of the other schools. Well, no, that's not my goal. My goal is to have the best equipment that we can give our kids. As a matter of fact, you remember I said we had textbooks that were not uh, uh, were outdated to some degree, like the science doesn't change that much. This semester, the East Center was profitable enough that we gave iPads to every student. I haven't done that in Mississippi State. They, have, they want to know how we did it. They sent people down and Ole Miss and others, and then they would do it. And you know why? Yesterday, the Secretary of Education for the United States Department of Education said he's challenging every school district, 5,000 in the country. We gotta move away from pen and pencil. We need a fair uh, playing field, and we need all our kids to start learning from electronic books. That's where the future. Last comment is, the future is the, the, what I call the boomer or the boom generation. We don't want to hit a ball where we see the ball now. We don't want to train kids for what's out there now. We want to help our kids achieve where that ball will be in the next five or 10 years. Don't ever be satisfied that 
I want to catch up to somebody. I never want to catch up. If I can't outrun you, I'm not certain why I'm in the race. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I too would like to express appreciation to the Hamer Institute for the invitation to share with you this afternoon. And we'd like to extend an, a special thank you to uh, Dr. McLemore, whom I've admired for many, many years. Uh, when I came to Jackson State in 19... <clears throat> I remember him walking along the campus, and he looked very much the same today as he did then, oh, and yeah. big, white, Afro, <laughs> all kinds of beautiful Porsche automobile that we were all very jealous of. So uh, I have watched him at a distance for a long, long time, and he has been a very private supporter of me, and I have been very supportive of him across the years. So that having been said, let me also say that anytime I have an opportunity to talk about education and its effects on our young children, I get very excited and I get very passionate about that topic because I do believe that the children are our future, as cliche as that might sound, that is a reality and I think we all know that. When I contemplate this question, what is the educational status of African Americans, I thought pretty much like my colleague to the right just indicated. He said we needed to talk about these issues from a data perspective. So as I tried to craft my response, I went to some very reliable resources to pull data. I went to the Southern Region Educational Board's report for Mississippi Facts 2012. I went to the National Center for Educational Statistics. Um, I also went to the Mississippi Education Department's website and looked at some information relative to the assessment of our learners in various schools across the state. And also took a look at some of IHL's most recent reports, particularly relative to the performance of children, well I should say of youth and young adults in college. And having looked at those things, rather than speculate or conjecture about the status of African Americans, let me tell you a few things that I found, and then subsequently I will share what my conclusion was. Uh, first of all, according to the most recent um, census report, 38% of Mississippi's total population in 2010 was black. 50% of all children enrolled in Mississippi schools 2010 and 2012 were black, according to the Mississippi Assessment Accountability Report System. That's first to put it in perspective. <coughs> Secondly, the nation's report card, which is the national, which is the national assessment of education of progress, revealed that Mississippi's average test scores on grade four have steadily increased since 1992. And the score gap with the nation has gotten smaller. And that's a good thing. It also revealed that the average fourth grade scores over time for both African American and white students' achievement has also improved. And there are particularly large gains from years 2000 to 2005, followed by minimum or flat results in 2011. The gap between Mississippi's white and African American fourth graders in math was 30 points in 1992, 24 points in 2011. And these are all signs that the gap is what? It's getting smaller. It's getting smaller, but guess what? It's still much too wide. There's a huge gap. When you look at the gap, whether you're looking at socioeconomic, whether you're looking at race, whether you're looking at gender, or whatever, it is much too wide. <clears throat> Since Fannie Lou Hamer, we have made marginal progress, in my opinion, just a modicum of progress, but we have a long road to hope. Thank you. All right, thanks. Okay, we're gonna ask, uh, Mr. Spears is gonna talk to us about the uh, general education uh, achievement on the K-12 level, I'm sure other things as well. Uh, yes. Is the projector ready? Yes, it is. It is. Okay. Good. I work better with a. Everybody hear me now? Okay. I work better with a uh, a PowerPoint because uh, rambles, and a PowerPoint keeps me on on point. So. Uh,
Um, just briefly, uh, I do work at the Mississippi Department of Education. Uh, I work uh, in, in the Office of Curriculum and Instruction. And what I want to talk about today briefly are a couple of things that will kind of get us to put this in a little bit of context in terms of educational attainment and achievement. As Dr. Taylor mentioned, uh, the progress that we've made on NAEP, the progress of the National Assessment and Educational Progress, and the progress we've made with the achievement gap is laudable. And it is a result of a lot of hard work for a lot of good educators. Uh, and, and now the challenge is, how do we understand accountability uh, in this age in terms of what, did we can, what can we do with it other than just label schools and label communities as failing or as, as, as successful because of what test scores are showing us? Uh, as it results, relates to African American uh, uh, students in Mississippi, we have to now begin to start asking critical questions about what are we preparing our young people to do? What are we preparing our young people to be able to take advantage of in terms of opportunities for success in the 21st century? Uh, and so what I want to focus on briefly is a couple of measures that, uh, that Dr. Bibby and uh, Taylor mentioned earlier. I want to uh, kind of extrapolate some of those. First of all, accountability in the state of Mississippi is, is divided into two groups of tests. One test for high school students and one set of tests for students in grades three through eight. The high school students take the Subject Area Testing Program, or SATP, as it's commonly referred to. And in the SATP, there are four courses, or in the course tests that they must take and pass in order to graduate. There's one in Algebra One, there's one in English Two or English 10, there's one in Biology One, and there's one also in U.S. History. Now, these are the results from 2011, 2012, last year, okay, of those students who were passing. Now, here is the question that we must ask ourselves. When we talk about passing the subject area test, what we're talking about is meeting a minimal standard, a very minimal standard, okay, because we also have what we call performance levels. We have basic performance, we have proficient performance, and we have advanced performance. Passing has nothing to do with either of those performance levels, okay. Passing is a minimal uh, level of achievement and accomplishment. Now, what we see here in terms of the comparisons between African American students and their white counterparts is that there's significant gaps in algebra one uh, pass rate, biology pass rate, and English 10 pass rate. I don't have US history scores because they were not aggregated or, or districts were not held accountable for US history scores last year because it was a new administration. Uh, and, and But I can tell you that the US history scores were the lowest in the history of the state for a variety of reasons. One of the main reasons is because the U.S. history test was revamped due to the revamping of the U.S. history course itself, which made it much more rigorous. And of course, uh, due to the good work of the Civil Rights Education Commission, we also added a component for civil rights and human rights history. Uh, and and what, we, what we're kind of guessing at this point, because the, the results are very brand new, uh, we're kind of guessing is that the instruction didn't really match the level of rigor and some of the content in the new course. Uh, so that's why the U.S. history scores were, were lower than they ever been. So we see significant gaps here. Also, um, the MCT, the grade three through eight tests, are very telling as well because the grades three through eight tests are basically centered around language arts uh, and mathematics, and we also have a science assessment, a science assessment in grades three through in grades five and eight, and we can see here the discrepancy in the science achievement of black students. In grades five, only 36% scored proficient uh, because they didn't pass fail with MCT because you don't have to really pass it in order to graduate or anything. It's just uh, a measure that they use in our terms of accountability. Uh, so in eighth grade, the proficiency rate for African Americans was 41% while as compared to uh, their, their, the white counterparts at 72%. Um, we can also see some similar scores in the MCT2 grade three uh, assessment. And I looked at grade three because that's typically the starting point of the test as well as uh, the kind of the litmus to see uh, how ready students will be in order to take advantage of learning opportunities in grades four through 12 because <coughs> grade three is where you basically, you've learned to read, now you're beginning to read to learn. You've learned to do math, now, you, now, you, now you, you're doing math in order to solve problems. So you, now you're applying what you've learned, the, the basics that you've learned in grades K through three now in order to really advance your education. As we see here, uh, uh, with the third grade, 42% uh, of African Americans were proficient, 65% of, of the white counterparts. Math, 56% were proficient, 77% of the white counterparts. Um, uh, the eighth grade, we don't see much of a change 
in that, in that gap as well. And so uh, the question we have to ask ourselves is, what do these scores tell us about our students being college and career ready? And I say college and career ready because Many of you may have heard of the Common Core State Standards from, for Mathematics and English Language Arts that have been adopted by the state of Mississippi. Those uh, standards are much more rigorous than the standards that were used to develop these, these tests, and they are correlated to what we call 21st century skills. 21st century skills are a set of uh, soft skills, so to speak, that uh, universities and colleges, professors, and entrance exam, uh, entrance uh, missions people, as well as industry leaders have said they want their, their young people coming out of high school to be, know and be able to do, to be successful in college or career, to, no matter what they're doing after they get out of high school, these are the things you need to be able to do. You need to be able to think critically, be creative, problem solve, work on your own, uh, work in groups as well, communicate effectively, these types of things. And so uh, with college and career readiness being the standard, there's another metric that I'd like to discuss uh, briefly. It's called the College Career Readiness uh, Metric from the American College Test, or the ACT. And uh, these, uh, the American College Test basically has said that students who take the ACT and can score at a certain level on four parts of the test. Uh, they have uh, whether the English test, a reading test, a science test, and a, a math test. Okay, so there's four parts, and you can score a certain level between 1 and 36 is the scale. And if you score an 18 on the English section, or if you score a 20 on the reading section, you score a 21 on the, on the uh, science section, you score on the 24 on the science section, you score a 21 on the math section, you have between, you have a 75% chance of scoring a C in your college, uh, first year college courses, you have a 50% chance of scoring a B on your first year college courses as a freshman. If you score at those levels on those four parts of the test. Now, number one, you can see here the state average 18.7. Black students 16.3, white students 20.6. Now, uh, in the state of Mississippi, that 18.7 represents the lowest in the country at this point, the lowest in the country. They last 50% at number 50. Uh, and also, but notice, the black students are scoring lower than the lowest. Okay. So we have to ask ourselves a very serious question. Uh, the second point uh, that we want to look at as well is this notion of uh, who was ready? When they say ready, they said that you scored at least three of those benchmarks that I mentioned earlier on those tests, three of those benchmarks. The state, 11% of the students scored at, at, the, at least three of those benchmarks. White students, 31% of the white students that took the test, only 5% of the black students that took the test. What are we going to do with this information? What does this tell us? One of the things that makes educators uh, frustrated as well as powerful is the use of data. How do we use data in order to plan? How do we use data in order to meet needs? How do we use data to understand uh, systemically how we are seeing the outcomes that we're seeing? The question I have to ask myself is, when I look at these scores, look at this data, is what is happening uh, in the classrooms, in these communities, such that our students are not becoming academically prepared? Okay. It's not really a commentary on the intellectual capacity of any of these students. Right. This is a commentary on the preparation that they've received, the education that they've received uh, in their particular schools. Because if you don't have access to certain types of educational experiences, you don't develop academic skills. If you don't develop academic skills, you're not going to be able to exhibit academic success, and you're not going to be able to take advantage of opportunities for academic success uh, in the future. So um, I'll stop right here. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and if anybody has any questions, I guess, uh, we can uh, I, we can entertain it or some of the panel. Yes. Well, looking at the data, and you see 16.3, there are a number of, of concerns that one might have. But first, the reason this one of the reasons that Mississippi is so low on ACT is that we're an ACT state. Mm -hmm. We have a larger percentage of our students taking ACT exams than any other state in the country. Mm -hmm. But uh, the other part is the minimum interest requirement to IHL institutions without taking remedial courses on which you do not obtain any credit in the 16. Mm -hmm. So what that's saying is most of the students coming out of uh, our K-12 system are going to be performing below the minimum interest requirement. Mm -hmm. 
And working with Tom Stalker and others, we did some grabs for the first Gear Up mm -hmm. grant. And we found this, that if you grab ACT scores and the percent African Americans in the district, they were inversely mm -hmm. proportional. Mm -hmm. And you can take any of these exams and it appears the same way. Mm -hmm. That the larger the percentage of African Americans, the smaller the performance and the lower the performance. That does not mean those school students can't achieve at a higher level, as you stated. Mm -hmm. But it does mean something is happening in those schools that's not happening in other schools. I'm glad that you mentioned that point, because um, as part of what I do at State Department Education, I'm investigating this very phenomenon. What's happening with advanced learning opportunities around the state? Um, one of the things that we've done, I'm working closely with the College Board at this point to try to figure out ways to grapple this issue. One of the things that we found is that we have a challenge in a lot of our districts, especially a lot of more predominantly African American districts, in terms of rigorous classwork. Uh, when we say rigorous classwork, what we find is that, uh, for instance, with uh, advanced placement courses, uh, advanced placement courses are supposed to be college level courses taught to high school to give students the opportunity to earn college credit while they're in high school. Okay. But so often, too often, what happens and what we find is, is that to get in those AP classes, the standards in terms of academic achievement, academic skill acquisition are very low in those districts because they're trying to find students to give them the opportunity to take the course. And, and we've actually gone back and forth uh, internally at City Park about this for a while. Uh, there's, a, there's a vein and an argument that says that regardless of the academic skill level of the student, if they're just in the classroom, they can benefit because the experience is going to let them see, well, this is a level of rigor, this is a level of reading, this is a level of math skill, basic skills I have to have to be successful. But the problem is, if you have a classroom with 20 students in an AP class, and 10 of them don't have the advanced skill level, or even minimal skill level, don't read at grade level, for example, when in an AP class, you should be reading above grade level, to be honest with you. If half the students in that class don't read at grade level, how are you going to, as a teacher, be able to keep the pace and rigor at the level of, of, of college preparatory, preparatorial uh, 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 rigor when half the students will get left behind? And so what ends up happening is, even though the class is called advanced placement, even though the textbook says advanced placement, the level of instruction and rigor is not meeting the required level uh, to prepare these students adequately for uh, the exam and it for, actually for uh, cause of a work. So what ends up happening is they're taking AP classes, but they're not really getting that, what we call the advanced placement experience. They're not really getting the opportunity to actually take full advantage of this uh, uh, course. And so what we have to do is we have to figure out ways to begin to show and demonstrate what it looks like to have advanced learning opportunities in these areas. Because a lot of times, and I'm just going to be frank with you, I've gotten calls from superintendents who are asking me, what does the AP class look like? What does it mean? You know, I've actually gotten calls from principals that said, do they have to take a test in order to get college credit? And it, and it fascinates me because what it speaks to what I spoke to earlier. When you have situations where you have communities that just don't have enough uh, people in those communities with the, with the capacity and with the expertise to actually deliver these kind of experiences, you know, the students lose out. And so it's not necessarily a question of intellectual ability, it's a question of preparation and a question of access and a question of equity. And so these are the kinds of questions we have to wrestle with if we really want to get to you know, the educational opportunities that we want to see for our young people. Does someone else have a question? Well, we're going to we'll, we'll yeah. have lots of questions. Yeah, good. Why don't we come back? Dr. Taylor, did you want to say anything on this particular issue? Or OK, thank you, Sarah. All right, so why don't we come back, and we will be returning to this question throughout you know, throughout the time period, but we're going to move. To, thank you. We're going to move to the uh, next question uh, that we're going to ask Dr. McHenry to take the lead on. On how would you rate general education achievement on the college level? For instance, the dropout rate. Uh, what we can do to encourage more people to attend either a community college or a four-year college? I, I spent a good part of my uh, academic career working with broadening participation of folks in school, all, all students, because we believe that the higher the participation, of, the larger the percentage of folks with baccalaureate degrees, the higher the per capita income, 
And there are a whole lot of metrics that say when you have a college degree, you're going to be healthier, a better lifestyle, you're going to earn more money, your children are going to succeed. So if, if you succeed, then your children are probably going to do at least as good as you in many instances. So we, we looked at those. I also worked at the National Science Foundation where we set numerical goals of, of how many uh, minorities, persons of color, should complete degrees in science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Uh, the, the skill set is going to be so critical for this nation's uh, economic competitiveness. So if the question is how would you rate general education, educational achievements on the college level, that uh, it has two possible answers. One is the core curriculum, what should an education, educated person be able to know and do? And I think, for the most part, <coughs> we're, we're doing rather well in getting college students ready to go out and compete for jobs. The, the challenge is college students are not leaving as prepared as they need to be to enroll in graduate schools. We have great graduate schools. The only problem with it is black or white, they're populated by folks from other countries for more than they are our countries, especially in this skill set. So we're doing some things well, some we're struggling with. The dropout rate, the dropout rate for Jackson State University as an urban institution is much higher than most urban institutions. And I've seen other non-minority institutions with lower dropout rates in Jackson State. And some pretty well known ones, but one that come to mind because of my kids in New Orleans is the University of New Orleans. Their, their graduation rate is somewhere in the low 20s or high teens. And so when you start talking urban education, you need to understand a four-year graduation rate or a five-year graduation may not be relevant. It may be a nine-year graduation rate because yeah. students are coming in and stopping out. And, and what can we do to encourage more people to attend community colleges in four years? I'd love to say I have this, the answer to that, but I think everybody in this room know the answer to that. What, what do you think the, the best way to encourage students to pursue college would be? Low tuition. Lower tuition is one way. I think money in general is another way. I think that scholarships, but you don't start scholarships and tell students you're eligible for a scholarship when they're in their senior year. Gear Up starts recruiting students for college when they're in the seventh grade, when they can start making those decisions about which courses to take. And we, we tell students, you know, you can take this set of courses, but this is where it leads. But if you are willing to take college out, excuse me, Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 and some of these other courses at an early age, you can move in, into uh, your, op your options are much broader. And in the creative class, and that's really it, from the way I understand the reading of where we are now as we move forward, the creative class will be the people who will be making decisions, determining what, how and where and what we do. And there'll essentially be two classes, the creative class and the non-creative class, or others. And it's the creative class, whether it's in the arts, the sciences, or whatever else is out there. Those are the folks who are going to be making decisions in the future. So I would rate uh, our card. You remember when we used to give an E for the effort and then a grade for the academic component? <laughs> I think in one of those, we're doing rather well. The other. I think the effort and the commitment to make certain that all students are achieving could be enhanced. I guess what I'd like to add to that conversation is that I'm concerned about the students when they get here in the first place. Uh, our colleague has already indicated two challenges, looking back at that 16 point whatever percent and then the 5 uh, percent. That's a huge challenge. And uh, Dr. McHenry has just indicated, well, we graduate them, but I'm not sure that we graduate them with the knowledge and skill level that they need to compete in this hugely technological uh, world and also to be global competitors in the marketplace. What this data says to me is that maybe we need to take a better, harder look internally at IHL. You know, usually when we talk about reform in education, to a great extent, we're talking about P12. But I'm thinking that we might need to come in and analyze and dissect what we're doing, how we're doing, um, 
in order to meet the needs of our children. I think we, we need to be a little bit more proactive. We know what the data are telling us. So what can we do in terms of planning interventions to better serve these students when they get to us? We know that we've got the non-traditional students who are coming in. We have a number of students who are coming in needing remedial work. The data is really telling us that more and more they are coming in needing remedial work. So I'm concerned about us putting our heads together with collective wisdom to start being proactive, to think about how we might reform internally to better uh, equip these students so that we don't just uh, graduate marginal students, but highly skilled, uh, high, highly competitive students. Um, yes. Dr. Taylor mentioned uh, the level of remediation that students have, have to have when they enter the college. And, and I mentioned accountability earlier. I want to make this clear. Um, accountability uh, should be a tool to use in order to inform educational decisions. What happens too often, especially in a lot of our struggling districts, is that accountability becomes the end. Because keep in mind something. Every student that comes to Jackson State has a high school diploma. Correct. And if they graduate from high school in the state of Mississippi, they passed all the SATPs. Uh, they passed all the required courses that need to take. And yet, when they show up at the university door at a rate of, as high as some places 70% of the freshman class need some sort of remediation. Yeah. And, and so now the question becomes, OK, now, what were we doing <laughs> at the high school grades? Yeah. Yeah. Were we equipping our students to be college and career ready? Or were we trying to manage accountability? Because all of those students met accountability. All of those students graduated, so that it helped with their graduation rate as part of the accountability model. All of those students performed past the, uh, the SATPs, which is part of the accountability model. And so the question becomes is, if, if, we're, if the goal is accountability, and yet accountability is not really serving the purpose of creating a, a class of students and a class of citizens that are college and career ready, what, where's the investment? What, where, what are we actually doing uh, with those resources? And so the thing, the, the thing I ask when I challenge principals and superintendents when, when we go to these districts and say, I'm saying, well, because a lot of times it, it kind of frustrates me to go into a school and you see all these signs up that says our goal this year is 85% proficient or our QDI score of 120, 125. I don't begrudge a principal or a superintendent that position is a high pressure position. It's a very hard position to do. But understand something, as a parent, if my child comes to your school and you say that the goal of the school is to get us some kind of QDI score, I'm going to question whether or not you're really in the business of educating young people. Come on, brother. Because so here's the reality. The reality is, if we're going to invest all these resources and all this time and all this effort into our school systems, and all they're doing is managing accountability rather than actually preparing our young people to be college and career ready, which is what the Common Core, get, which is why I'm so excited about the Common Core, because they stay stated very plainly. The goal of, of Common Core standards is college and career readiness. Mm -hmm. Accountability is just a way to get there. It is not the end. And so as a community member, I'm asking, okay, our, our school is successful. Our school has a C, our school has a B, our school has a D. What does that mean in terms of whether or not my child can get, a, get that college career readiness benchmark on the ACT? And how can they do that if in the school, and this is what happens sometimes, and like I said, I don't begrudge principals, I know they have a hard task, but if the first time you took algebra one was in the 11th grade, because the, the counselors and the principals got together and said, well, if you take it in the ninth grade, you're gonna hurt our accountability, it happens. The question becomes, isn't that really educational malpractice? Yes. 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 Isn't that the situation that we see oftentimes in all these communities? I, I'm glad you mentioned the data that you saw where it was inversely proportional to the degree of African American uh, 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 students in, in, in test scores. Because what I find oftentimes is it's not the intellectual capacity that's holding them back, it's the educational plan that they've been on since pre K, probably. Right. You know, and, and, and that's about us adults. You know, one of the things that, uh, that, that fascinates me is that we bash children a lot. And, and especially in Mississippi, we bash them a whole lot. We, you, know, you know, if a kid comes to school with his pants sagging, he's going to jail almost. Yeah, yeah. You know, but, the, the, but the, the, I, I often ask the question, do we ever pause to say for one second, well, why is the pants 
is coming back. I work with a couple of mentoring programs in the city, and I love mentoring, and I, and I thank God for it, because I was mentored, because I grew up in a single parent household myself. So, but if I have to have another discussion about sagging pants, I'm, 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 I'm going to just get up and walk out, because the reality <laughs> is, sagging pants is not the issue. <laughs> sagging pants are not the issue. What the issue is, is how come John Tyrone in West Jackson sags his pants while Mike in Madison doesn't, doesn't see the need to do so? Maybe because the opportunities that Mike sees for his life and, his, and the opportunities he's seeing in his school to actually uh, get a better education and go forward are a lot more relative to his lived reality than what Tyrone is seeing in West Jackson. These are just stereotypical examples. Yeah. Yeah. So the challenge we have to ask ourselves is our educational system. Are we really doing what we need to do to prepare our young people to, 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 be, to be successful? Not necessarily imagine accountability, but to be successful. Uh, may I come into uh, Quickly, <laughs> you know, we heard earlier about the different buckets that people are placed in. And it's great what the students graduate from high school are they college ready. But what shocked me when I was at IHL working with uh, Mr. Haynes, I don't know if you guys know him, we looked at those databases and we found 40% of our students weren't getting out of high school. Mm. What are they going to do? Right. I don't know if it's still that way, but if you got to answer that one. No, I'm not going to answer. I mean, I think there was a, a, a missing point, and I was trying not to say no, but you know, I'm We're talking about kids who are graduating from high school in the ACT. To your point, the numbers who don't graduate from high school and the, 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 the correlation to those who are in the penal system, mm -hmm. right? Well, that, our communities have failed, right? I happen to have been this, this several weeks ago at the legislative budget hearings mm -hmm. when both the commissioner of correction, the commissioner of IHL, um, the um, executive director of colleges and junior colleges, mm -hmm. uh, they all talked about remediation and the cost of remediation, black and white kids. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we talk about, you know, we talk about how our children are not doing well, right? And this, for those who were earlier, this really isn't correlated to electoral politics because it is about policy priorities and where the funding is. We know that they're going to give already the Division of Corrections, what they call a deficit appropriation when they come back in January because they don't have enough money. The same money they have, are not going to spend on early education. Right. And every one of those people said, if you did, if you, Chris Epps, Division of Corrections, if you want to decrease the number of people in prison. Division of in prison, early do early ed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We don't have the will to do that. Mm. So we can talk about this, right? We can talk about this. The reality, our children are not being prepared, and they're not being prepared in our communities, and we're not preparing them. I, I have worked with superintendents, and I was mind blown when we were talking about, so like, what before, when they have the old ranking, and we're talking about start, what would be required to be a start school district? These superintendents, God bless them, said, you know, we don't think about what, what's required to be a start school district. We think about what's required not to fail. Mm. It's a very different mindset. Right. It's a very, very different mindset. And it is, in many ways, very much reflective of us in our community. Amen. Going back to Derek's point around the disintegration, we are very confident that my child will do well. But the child who lives in a community that that's not like mine, we don't necessarily think that child is going to do well. And part of how Again, looking back, Mrs. Hamer, right? What is it that she see and how is it that she saw community and education so we, we don't have this? Um, everybody, the, the family of, in Shaw, Mississippi, Shaw, Shelby, that integrated the schools, the grandson is now in Parchment. Mm, mm, mm. We gotta do something about that. Okay. Okay, we need to let the panel okay. get prepared, finish their points, and then I promise we're going to have lots of time for the give and take. So, so um, Dr. Taylor, why don't you go ahead and address this, 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 yeah, this remaining, with, with the one you wanted to address. The progress. Sure. Okay, again, looking back through the eyes of Fannie Hamer, 
from our time, what kind of progress have we made? And I think I established earlier in my earlier comments that we have made some progress. Progress is very slow and it does take time. And as I said, we have a long road to hope. But let me just uh, delineate um, a few of the significant changes that I think are worth noting. Uh, from her eyes, she would be very happy to know that since she started the Head Start program in her hometown in 1968, the Head Start programs have proliferated, not only across the state of Mississippi, but across this country. And based on the data relative to the importance of an early start, tapping into these children at an early age, birth through age three, that is very, very significant. So I think she'd, be, she'd have a smile on her face and chant her wonderful songs as she heard that statistic. Well, not a statistic, but that fact. Secondly, I think that under um, Governor William Winter, we were very fortunate enough to uh, have kindergarten accessible to all of our children. Uh, and prior to Fannie Lou Hamer, that was not a fact. We're also fortunate since her time to have compulsory school attendance laws. Children now, ages 6 through 17, are required to be where they need to be during the day and uh, circumvent the possibilities of getting in trouble and finding themselves in that pipeline to prison that our colleague uh, out here just spoke about. I think it is important to note that we have desegregated, desegregated schools across the state of Mississippi. Now, there may be some instances of de facto segregation in pockets and corners around the state, but for the most part, we can, can, we can thank Brown uh, versus Brown, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, and all those uh, 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 litigations, I'll call them, that help to establish that fact. Good or bad, uh, we have busing, which actually started shortly before the death of uh, Fannie Lou Hamer in the early 70s, in fact, 1970. And let me just say to you that I was among the first uh, children to be bused. And uh, that was one of the strategies that was used for desegregation, and it is still being used. And I'm not so sure that that is a plus or a minus, but that is the situation. I'm happy, and as I know Fannie Lou Hamer would be, black history is now being integrated in curricula across school districts. Just a little bit, but we are making baby steps to create greater visibility of diversity uh, from a cultural perspective uh, across our curricular offerings. I think it's very important to know that before Fannie Lou Hamer, we didn't have the information age that we have now. We didn't have uh, uh, integration of technology, the application of technology for teaching, for learning, for research, for assessment, and all the other uh, uh, things that we, we use technology for. So I think she'd be very happy to know that we are integrating technology, that we have access, and that we have the numerous advances related to technology that are applicable to schools and schooling. I think she'd be happy to know that we have organized systematic mentoring and tutoring programs for our kids who are at risk. Many of them are community-based, some of them are in schools. For example, we have the National Coalition of 100 Black Men in schools, working with children, being role models. Statistics, statistics tell us that in many homes where there's a single parent, more often than not, the female, the young boys have very few opportunities to even have a real decent conversation with a man. So programs like that are very, very important to help to shape and model and prepare our young boys, particularly. Uh, there seems to be uh, a greater presence of positive black role models in television, in movies, in textbooks before Fannie Lou Hamer, that just was not the um, scenario. So I think she'd be delighted to see that she can turn on the television and not see Amos and Andy, but see Barack Obama. Um, the next point I'd like to make is that um, since Fannie Lou Hamer, we have a number of black leaders, African American leaders, in, in school uh, districts across the, the state. We have more that are serving as principals. 
curriculum specialists, and we have a huge number that are serving as superintendents, and that's a good thing. If you look at the university, the same is true. What I really would like to point out is that we have more females serving in those roles as well. I think that's important to note. You cannot separate school, schooling, and education from politics. Who makes policy related to schools and schooling? Who makes decisions about funding? So in that context, I think she'd be very happy to know that we have more elected officials who are black, particularly, and you know who they are within the state as well as nationally, and I think that's important. And as our colleague just talked about, I think uh, having a common core state standards is important. I think it's important to note that Mississippi stands accountable. We have positioned ourselves to say under the leadership of uh, Ronnie Musgrove, we don't mind you're taking a look at our education system through NAEP. We were among the first states to say, okay, you can come in, we'll be tested, we will share and compare our data results because we want to to stare the truth in the face. We want to know what the issues are, what the problems are, so that we can begin to do something about them. So I think those are just a few of the educational improvements that have occurred or the progress that has been made, and there are many, many more, but in the context of the time that I have, and my colleagues will probably want to chime in as well. Thank you. Okay, I know he has been. Okay, so, so we've, heard, we've, heard these different, we've heard these different points of view, and so I guess we're going to throw it open now to all of us. What are the remaining challenges? We've talked about the ways in which politics, economics, all intertwine. We see the relationship between them, particularly in the area of education. So we're going to start with you, Mr. Barber, and what do you think? Tobin. Tobin, I'm so sorry. I'm Mr. Tobin. Tobin. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm so Mr. Sorry. Berger, are you in the yeah. house? <laughs> Please. Could I borrow this so they can hear? I would like to pick up where Attorney Pam Shaw uh, said about the, uh, regarding the schoolhouse, jailhouse pipeline. Uh, it's well known that uh, by the age of third grade, they're keeping data on poor performing students to uh, uh, budget and plan for beds in prisons. Uh, I'm involved with organizations that oppose for profit private prisons. Uh, see uh, NGO and uh, Corrections Corporation of America are two of the biggest. Uh, this is uh, corporate racism going on here. And I think it should be said. Uh, when I look at some of these statistics, the big gaps between black and white bother me. And I ask the question, to what extent is racism playing in all of this? Racism in a corporate way, like where is the money going? If we can, uh, if we can uh, uh, increase the budget for the uh, Department of Corrections, what about the budget for education? They're just getting ready to go into it and slash it some more. Uh, the whole income gap between rich and poor in this country, this, you know, racism is alive and well. Uh, I don't think um, just yelling racism, you know, to some people they just turn people off about it. But we have, you know, we're, we're a family here and we're talking the truth to one another and we have to say what it is. And we have to develop ways to, to deal with some of this uh, uh, problem with for-profit private prisons. Because that's the underbelly of, of education. We, we worry about remediation. What do we do with these students that come into the that come into Jackson State and they have to take a whole semester just to get to qualify to get in the, the door to start? You know, are, are they, uh, why are they like that? Where did they come from? Where is the resources? Where is the money? Where is the, if Madison can have top quality schools or these white academies that are still out there, can they have white uh, top quality schools? What about, what about uh, the other communities? There's the, the, the misappropriation of funds. I think somebody's got to say something about that. Well, one, one component, I think I heard someone say that Madison and some of the other schools, the private schools, do not take all students, as I understand. Is that what you're saying? No. Charter schools don't take all students. 
Oh, charter they, schools. Well, they take them all, they're going to keep them all. <laughs> I assure you, there are ways in some of the more affluent student schools, if there's a student there that's not performed to their level, they'll make it very convenient for that student to find another school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I believe there is some segregation as it relates to why this school is so high performing and this one is not. Of course, they build prisons based on the number, the reading scores. And they third. lobby, very, very, they lobby against education funding so they can use the schools as feeders. If my understanding is we want to look through the eyes of Fannie Lou Hamer and her generation and the giants who walked back then, how would they view not the students, but how they view us as professionals. What are we doing to change the status quo? We can talk about how bad it is. How many people in here do not know how bad it is? No one. So we need to talk about what can we do as a group, which means we'll be a little uncomfortable. We'll do some things, we might, as, as of course Ms. Hamer did, but we, if we're going to make change, we're going to have to be a little bit disruptive. I have a couple quick comments and questions for you, Dr. McHenry. Yes, sir. I, and let me say, first of all, I actually, I actually like this discussion because I think one of the first things we need to do is to change the discourse in this state on this very question. Um, and I've listened very carefully, and I've talked to people over the last eight years that I've been here. And what I see uh, very quickly is that, uh, that, the, that the discourse really hasn't changed. Every morning, if public radio does a piece on education, and this is no offense to white people in this room, everybody who they bring on is white. Now, these are the same kind of folk who used to run education system in the state. Now, Pam has pointed out many times that when we look at these school districts, uh, we know who run them. These are black folk, right? We need to raise some, some serious questions about how we change the discourse, right? Chelsea's here, but Chelsea knows how, how that conversation goes down around all these issues inside the Department of education among his, his white colleagues. We need to change the discourse. First comment. Second comment is that when we look at this matter of, of, of the appropriations, Mississippi has something that I didn't know existed until I got here, something called the Adequate Education Act. Yes. I know enough about what adequate means to know that that's problematic. Okay? And it seems to me that that's also part of the, the uh, discourse that we need to change. Now, uh, and the hearing that Pam talked about, based upon the, 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 the piece I heard from the hearing, is that as opposed to uh, providing the Department of Ed this, this additional funding, which they have to submit every year, they know they're going to get $300 million, uh, then one of, one of the, these uh, um, uh, smart-ass white boys told them, well, we need to just drop the act, right? We, we're not going to fund it, so we just drop the act. Now, that would be good if they had something more comprehensive. My question, Dr. McKinney, uh, I've heard the, the report uh, from uh, uh, Arne Duncan on uh, yesterday. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I'm alive in the 21st century. I love this, this technology. But I grew up at a, a time where I understood very early that reading uh, enables one to reason, that writing is a thinking process. And I, I'm wondering how you really think about uh, the matter of uh, going into complete electronic learning. Uh, can you articulate to us what that may do for, uh, for a, a generation now that don't like to read, okay? And don't like to think, and don't like to be challenged on these things. And so I, I'm, I'm concerned that, that we, we have to try to find a, a sort of hybrid way of doing that. Because books are very, very, books are fun. Books are very important, okay? And, and trying to get our students to read and write um, has to, to take place in a way that as we introduce this new technology, uh, that we also do those things that we know we want, that we need to, to do to get people to uh, learn. So can you talk a little bit more about where you, you actually see all of that going? Thank you. Thank, thank you for giving me that opportunity. I can tell you that while I've been in school a good portion of my life, I learned a lot about reading and writing uh, from uh, the person who really controls much of my life. My wife is an English teacher, and she's been uh, a proponent of increasing the reading skills for students all since I've known her. And uh, I actually worked with Larry Souter, who was the person who brought Nate to Mississippi, and I worked with him in D.C., so I know a lot about that. And I, tomorrow we're going to work with um, Macmillan Publishing Company, 
and we're going to look at iBooks and eBooks and things of that nature. And I don't see the paper book versus the electronic book as being that different. This is a bookshelf. It looks like a bookshelf. You go and you get the books and you move it over. It's just a better way of accessing it. Number one, maybe I should ask this question. There are a lot of people under 20. How many of you have PlayStation? Or how many of you have the other electronic tools? We do that. This is the new generation, as, as Duncan stated. People are going to go there and they're going to be able to read, but it's not going to be primarily in the future for books. There's one school district in California for their kids purchased 34,000 iPads. The kids would get them, check them out, go home. Florida's going 50% with electronic books in a few years, and Alabama, I think, passed a $100 million bond. So this is not something that we have an option to do. Mm -hmm. This is the way the world is evolving, and knowledge is transmitting so fast that if you're in a classroom and students have these, they're going to question. It's a different type of uh, learning and teaching that would take place. We have to know that they can check everything. They can do things that we never dreamed of doing. I don't think I've answered your question adequately, but I'm going to wait till I hear this one, and I'll come back to it. So I thought that she had a I know, he's not letting me, though, is he? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yes, can you speak loud? Well, let's, we'll work our way. We've got time. We've got time. Especially if people ask questions and not just make <coughs> statements. Jill's idea of changing the discourse a little bit. I heard a lot of really important ideas today about what's wrong with our schools, and not once did you talk about teachers. And all I hear in the discourse is an attack on teachers. And I, I'd like to know why I heard such an intelligent conversation about school here without an attack on teachers. And we're talking about communities that are poor, communities that are isolated, communities that are segregated, communities where young people don't see a future for themselves, as having an impact on how students are achieving in school. And uh, I just want to hear your response to that because I, I think teachers are really taking up too many hits. I agree with you, but before I respond, okay. I'd like to respond to your question, but before I respond to your question, may I please piggyback on this one? Uh, in terms of the technology integration, particularly as it relates to the use of books, I'm a reading specialist as well. One of the things that I see in schools, as Dr. McHenry has said, that you have all kinds of contraptions, electronic contraptions, forgive me for using that term. However, I don't think the intent is, I don't think the intent necessarily, you know, books have been around for a long time. We treasure books. People will always have books at home in libraries. I don't think libraries are going to disappear either. I think these uh, electronics are used to complement, not supplant what we do. You know, we have all kinds of teaching styles. We have students' learning styles. There may be students who can work more independently, individually, using some of the electronics. You may have other kids in the class with a different kind of learning style who learn better from the traditional book, from the traditional instruction, who may not be as self-directed as, self as independent to work with the electronics. So I just wanted to, to say, um, from a, the perspective of someone who loves books, that I don't think books are going to go away. And I, I know that was not the, the big picture, but I, I do want to make a comment. If you remember when Clyde, when the secretary introduced this subject, he said, by going to electronic books, you'll have more individualized instruction, which you can address the individual needs. I'm, I'm saying they'll be blended also. I don't think we're going to have a total removal of all books. But my daughter teaches community college in Louisiana. And two things, she can check out books on her iPad. She doesn't have to go to the library to get her books to, to do things. And as it re relates to remediation, all the legislators go to these regional meetings and they discuss how students are performing. And what they're looking at now is what's happening in Louisiana. They're removing remedial courses from university campuses. And everybody is, is eventually trying to jump on that bandwagon that universities are too expensive to require parents to pay for courses that students should have got free in high school. 
Yes, Grandma, we will never give you three or four minutes. Okay, now this question. Here, yeah, we have a question. Am I on? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. All right. Relative to that question, that concern, I share your view. I think teachers are being attacked unfairly. If you will recall, in I think it was 1983, on the Reagan administration, a very important report was released. It was called the Nation at Risk. And what that Nation at Risk report revealed, for the most part, was that schools are failing that America is losing um, its first uh, uh, first place and being the leaders uh, in the country in terms of education and, and blah, blah, blah. The first person to have the finger pointed at them was the teacher, or were the teachers. Now we all know that a number of factors or variables contribute to a child's educational success. These people who are complaining and criticizing, the, the teachers don't understand that these kids, for the most part, many of these kids, I should say, come from home so they have not even had breakfast in the morning. So how can they focus and achieve when their basic needs are not met? Some of these kids from poverty areas, particularly in the Delta, don't even have beds to sleep on. They don't know where their meal is coming from when they get that free lunch at school. So according to Maslow's theory of self-actualization, before a kid can achieve his basic needs need to be satisfied. Beyond that, there's so much pressure on teachers in terms of accountability, the paperwork, uh, trying to give the individualized attention to overcrowded classrooms, mm -hmm. not having adequate resources, people resources, materials resources, not having the parents at the table working in partnership knowing what's going on in the school so that they can support the teaching when they go home. Amen. So all of these things coupled together, coupled with the fact that teachers are not only teachers, we're not just doing t um, reading math and arithmetic. We gotta teach these kids about second education now. Did you see that recently, you know, with this big issue of teen pregnancy, it was mentioned earlier today, whether you agree or disagree that teen pregnancy is a problem. I believe it is a problem. I think it's a strong correlation between students being successful and being early parents. I also believe that there's a vicious cycle when you have children raising children, guess what? Amen. So, I mean, all of these factors have to be considered when you talk about the teacher's job, when you teach, talk about accountability and the criticism that's being directed toward teachers. I think what we can do, talking about solutions, is just make sure that we can recruit the best and the brightest teachers. And thank you very much. And, and pay them. Right. <laughs> you know, when, when Education Trust went to Chicago, and they met with the inner city school districts. What did they learn? The kids were not being challenged. And when they had focus group settings with groups of students, what did the students tell them they wanted? They said one thing, we already know we're poor, we know where we come from, we want some good teachers so we can break this cycle. The students telling the adults in the room, we want good teachers. Second point, Sanders in Tennessee, and I don't remember his name now, I worked with him 100 years ago, but Sanders was a mathematician, and he said, we know good teaching when we see it. We can measure it, and we know its impact. And they said no, and he set up scales, and he tested the students before they were the first day of class, last day of class, and a measure of a good teacher was someone who can move a student from where they are, like Fanny New Hamer would say, to where they ought to be. It might not be up with some student somewhere else, but he did that, and they did a whole group. That was such a good thing. They made one mistake. They started applying it to charter schools and private schools. Guess what they found? The inner city school teachers were actually better than some of the suburban teachers at helping students achieve at our level, so of course he had to leave town. Okay, we have at least three questions that are still out of the audience that want to be asked. I see four, and we have about four minutes left. So the way we're going to do this is I'm going to ask all of the questions to be asked, and then we'll take a few, you know, let the questions get out, and then we'll give each of our speakers a few minutes that they can address which of those they feel they can in the time we have left, okay? Does that work? Yep. All right, so here's our first question. Would the nation Okay, all right. 
I taught at Lanier High School for a year in U.S. history and government. And uh, we brought up test scores drastically because we acknowledged the students' learning staff um, for world history, world wars, and things such as that. I found that when I uh, prepared PowerPoints, did DVDs, right. we did hands-on visual assessment tools and things such as that, we were able to bring those test scores up. You first have to acknowledge or conduct an assessment to aggregate where, where the need is. You know, and we saw that once we used PowerPoints, visual aids, they were able to relate to the information and actually remember the information for the test. And also, the last piece is we must acknowledge psychology and sociology when we start talking about education and making sure they sustain growth. Thank you. Thank you. Call you back here. Yes. Uh, kudos, kudos, kudos. I'm learning in rehab about the need for proper assessment modules. Assessment modules. If you want to know how to fix the problem, you got to first figure out what you're dealing with. So if you have assessment models that should start in the early ages, and then you find out what folks are good at, focus them towards those areas, have a fallback plan in terms of manual skill sets to fall back on beyond that that's still in that basic area in terms of solutions. Pedagogy will be a fresh free follow for year. Okay. Miseducation of the Negro. Mm -hmm. Psychological development of the black child, Amos Wilson. Most of y'all ain't read that. Come on with me. Now all I'm saying is this. The, the focus that we going on, PhD, right. is in the wrong direction. We focusing on the producing excellence for a job mentality, mm -hmm. as opposed right. to setting up the educational curriculum to produce excellence for self-sufficiency. Right. As long as that paradigm exists, you're going to continue to get what you get, and the system's going to continue to work the way it's working. If Dr. McLemore is not appointing people to be head of the prison to reduce his recidivism rate, the rate is going to stay exactly the way that it is. Now, I was going to ask the question, but I already knew the answer to the question before I asked the question. <laughs> I, I mean, sadly. And I, I hate to say this, but when you get too wrapped up in data, unfortunately. That's like, what you say, you can't see the forest for a tree. The data will have you so discombobulated, you will miss the first point what Fannie Lou Hamer would catch. That this stuff ain't designed to help you in the first place. It's designed to keep you in second place. If you can't get that part first, because you're wrapped up in the data, then you're going to miss the direction you're supposed to organize the curriculum to have empowerment over your environment. Thank you. That's what the purpose of education is supposed to be. Since we're not asking questions, I'm going to stay Mrs. Hamer was a woman of action. She saw a need, and she didn't wait to see who could help her do it. She got out, and she did it. We are talking about having the largest number of black elected officials in the nation. And Mississippi takes a great deal of pride on that. But this is also the greatest concentration of black people in the nation. So some of that has to be related. We are talking about having black school district leaders and black university leaders. I graduated high school in 1966. It was still very much segregated. The school boards were white. IHL was white. But we sent black students to Columbia. We sent black students to Fairleigh Dickinson. I went to the College of St. Catherine. We sent black students to Harvard and Yale. Today, we've got 5% of the black students in this state are not ready for college, or only 5%. We've got to stop crying racism. Racism will always be with us. And black people are as racist as anybody else. We have got to start taking responsibility for ourselves. When black school board members are not doing the job and black students are suffering, we need to call them on it. MAEP has never been funded in Mississippi. And you talk about the greatest number of black elected officials. What are they doing for their children? But we don't call them on it. We are so grateful and blessed to be able to call somebody a doctor, that we don't call them on our children not getting an education. The black nationalists back here, power to the people, 
He talked about data, and it is true. We talk about quantity, so much of this and so much of that. When are we going to talk about quality? We don't talk about quality. We have got to take responsibility for ourselves and stop pointing at the other person. It's not everybody else's fault all the time.
the sense of community has to be taken into context too because we don't have, my family sits down and we talk about politics, right. we watch the debate and right. we talk about how Obama is it, Romney is it, but not all families do that. Right. We don't have anybody to share that with. So we have to keep into mind to reach out and to not count the, the high school voice out or the middle school voice out because that's when we first start having the pain. It's not just about elementary kids. It's about all of us. That's all I'm going to say. Mine is a factual question. Spears, yes, what happened to the no child <coughs> In this, no she, she asked, uh, what happened to No Child Left Behind Mississippi? No Child Left Behind is still here. Uh, what we have in place is what we call a waiver for meeting that uh, impossible 100% proficiency of 100% reading uh, level by 2014. Nobody was going to reach that. So what we have in Mississippi is a waiver from reaching that particular goal. But the waiver that's in place um, accounts for a lot of, uh, of, of what we would call uh, Basically, it says that we're going to make progress with achievement in general. Uh, and we're going to do that by looking at the highest performing students in every school and the lowest performing school, students in every school. Look at that gap and work toward making that gap uh, uh, smaller and smaller. Uh, and I think that uh, by 2017, uh, they want to see like about 85% reduction in, in, in those things of that nature. It's a very, uh, uh, if you want to know more about it, uh, there's a link on the MDE website, mde.k12.ms.us, under Hot Topics. It's called the ESEA. That's the actual No Child Left Behind Law. It's the you know, ESEA waiver. Uh, is a link there. Look at that, and you can see that there. Um, I, I just wanted to, 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 to mention uh, uh, that um, I, I've learned a lot today, and, I, and I've learned a lot about you know, the struggle and, and, and the things that we have to say, have to, have to do in order to make it happen. Um, one of the things that I want us to keep in mind is that we do have schools in our communities that do a lot of great work. Uh, we have schools, uh, the, the Young Sister Mitchell Pecan Park, uh, uh, there, there are schools all over this great state of Mississippi that are doing a lot of great work, uh, regardless of what the so-called accountability grade tells you. Uh, the, I, and, and I agree with the, the brother at the top there who, who talks about what is our education supposed to do. Uh, should our education uh, uh, train us to, to assume uh, inferior positions, or should it empower us and liberate us uh, to be master of our own faith? Uh, and I think that sometimes in, in the midst of all the politics and all the, uh, the machinations of public schooling and things, we miss that vital point that for, for a lot of people, uh, I know for me personally, education is the way out. Uh, developing academic skills and, and, and becoming uh, educated uh, can open up a world of doors for a lot of our young people. There, there are uh, one of the reasons why I'm still passionate today about education is because I know I go to a school and I see a school struggling, but I see a little black boy sitting in the back uh, uh, who the teacher sees as a stereotype. I see that as, as a reflection of myself. That was me, you know. And, and, and because of schooling and because people reached out through schooling and, and gave me an opportunity to develop my mind, to develop uh, my communication skills, my critical thinking skills, my problem solving skills. Uh, it opened up doors for me, and I, up, I know it can open up doors for any young person if given a, a great opportunity and a great chance to do so. Um, one last thing, too, that, that I want to stress is that um, the technology piece is going to be very vital. The Common Core State Standards Assessment is going to be a world different from what we see right now with MCT2 and SATP testing. It's not going to be a bubble test. It's going to be performance-based assessments, and not only will they be performance-based, there will be performance-based assessments taken through technology, mm -hmm. through iPads, through laptops. Every single student, every single student will be expected to be able to perform uh, different research tasks, different problem-solving tasks through technology. So if our schools are not equipped, our teachers are not prepared, our principals are not visionary enough to prepare to equip our students to be technologically proficient, that will be another barrier toward experiencing them experiencing success in the 21st century economy. Now, I'm not a technocrat myself. You know, I still have a, a 2005 Blackberry that all it does is tell me when emails come. Uh, I can't surf that on my Blackberry, but the reality is, is that if we waste time 
uh, teaching kids obsolete skills. That's right, sir. Uh, we're going to cripple them. This is why, I, this is a, the question of education is the question of adults. And, 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 and what adults see the potential in our young people. What our adults see the potential in that school building in our community. What, our, what adults see as opportunities for success in these communities. And so if, if we don't understand the te technology, we need to under try to work hard to understand it because if not for us, we definitely need it for our children. So thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. Dr. Taylor, I know had something she wanted to say quite a bit earlier, yeah. I didn't get the chance. <laughs> This is just a one minute response to I think a concern that came up from there and here and it's going to be one minute because we're really out of time here. Um, in terms of the whole notion of what happens to ex-offenders, that's not the term you use but that's what you meant. Uh, when they're released into society, what happens? Do they, uh, be, do they victimize again? Do they go back? Uh, you talked about the recidivism rate. I am happy to say that this conversation has become a national conversation through the U.S. Department of Justice. Right here in Jackson right now under um, Mayor Harvey Johnson, a task force has been organized representing various stakeholders around the city of Jackson. And they are coming together to compete for uh, uh, money under what's called the Second Chance Act uh, with the understanding that these uh, offenders, if they're lucky, will be released into society. The question becomes, when they get out, do they just simply go back because there was no type of rehab for them, no type of intervention? You know, what can we do to give them life sustainability so they don't have to show up at our houses in an adverse way? So that conversation is on the table on the uh, second chance uh, money. And you'll hear more about that, I'm sure, very soon. It's not just in Jackson, the city of Jackson, but it's a conversation taking uh, place across the state. Even uh, the conversation regarding uh, not asking about uh, criminal records to some degree. And I know there'll be a whole other conversation about that, but that's, uh, that's dialogue that's coming in part. You want closing comments this for a second? This is your last shot. Uh, my, my last <laughs> shot. Uh, I was a freedom of child uh, person when Federal Hamer was doing her activities at the uh, Democratic Convention. And I was the only African American male in the classroom. And there was a lot of things going on that didn't make sense to a 10th grader why my brother was fighting for freedom. And we were suffering with some of the things that happened for, to the freedom of choice children. So this country can get mixed up and it can get into folks' man. I say that to say students want stability. Students want people to admire and someone they can look up to. If Fannie Lou Hamer was here today, I think one of the things she might say is, with all the good things that young black men and young black uh, women, students and boys are doing, why don't we hear more of it? Because if you, all you hear, the only ones who, what, you know the mass murderers who go out and kill folks, they won't even say their name because they think it'll encourage others. Yet if we cross the street wrong, front page with our handcuffs on. So, you know, this, this society needs to grow up a little too. And we need to take responsibility. Thanks. Yeah. All, right. All right, so let's thank our panel. Thank you for attending the Hammer Institute this year.